Uh, hey, welcome everybody. So I, I first want to say thanks to Pam Simon uh, for letting me moderate what is going to be the best panel at Manifest. It is a drop the mic, walk off stage, Manifest ends after this panel. Um, we'll do quick introductions, uh, uh, just kind of run down the line. I'm Stan Green. I run our supply chain investments for Bloomberg Capital. I'm also uh, work with Warburg Pincus as an executive in residence. I'm Paul Brazier. I'm the Vice President of Dre and the Intermodal Services at ITS Logistics and oversee all of our external operations. Weston Le I'm Weston Labar, uh, currently Chief Strategy Officer for Cargomatic, America's number one supply chain freight company, moving your stuff where you need it, when you need it. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Larry Cuddy. I'm the CEO of, uh, and founder of Invase. Good afternoon, everybody. Abs Kapoor, Chief Executive at Next Trucking. Next effectively lives and breathes Drage, and we are in this world with a mission to build an interconnected uh, operating system to connect Drage across the country, and looking forward to the conversation. Uh, you might find it's a couple of competing commercials throughout the uh, panel. I'll try to keep it in line. Uh, so look, we're gonna start with in what's happened in the last couple of years. What right now is, or are some of the most important aspects of a DRE provider in today's world. Um, Wesson, why don't you start, and I'll come back, and I'll mix it up a little bit. Yeah, no, thank you, Stan. And for those of you who don't know me in my previous life, I ran the Harbor Trucking Association for seven years. So to say that I'm a freight nerd is an understatement. And, you know, I think in general, when you're talking about business, it's all about your customers. It's how you treat your customers. It's about providing them with the perspective that they feel like they have a reliable and agile service, somebody that can meet their needs, moving their freight, understanding their problems, and quickly coming up with solutions. And on top of all of that, we're all becoming technology companies at the end of the day. So when you're able to provide your customers with a solution where they have predictability in their network at the same time, where they feel confident in you and you are taking good care of your customers uh, with regular check-ins. I mean, we have customers that we meet with every day when they have big things going on, every day. And then also giving them the surety of having the technology over top of it so they can see their freight and they can see what's going on. That's really what you need these days. And do not underestimate having assets. We're a technology company. We own asset subsidiaries. Why do we do that? We do that because our customers want to know that the trucks are available where they want them, when they want them, and then we supplement with the 35,000 trucks we have on our, on our network. So, all right, so Ab, same question. What's important to have as a DRE provider in today's world? Look, I, first things first, I couldn't um, agree more with what Weston said. I think keeping focus on the customer and genuinely, I mean, there's a lot of talk that happens about technology, data, um, AI. Quite frankly, what is it that, that delivers to the customer. And, and for us, especially the, the way I see Drage, a lot of people talk about it being antiquated, a, a lot of processes have not changed or haven't moved with times. I think in addition to really focusing on, on, on the customer being the shipper, um, it's also important to focus on what's the value that is being brought to each key aspect and each key participant in that value chain. I think the carriers, are, are an integral part of that. But also thinking about, it, we, we, unlike what Weston said, we have an asset light approach uh, to the problem. But making sure that the asset owners that are deploying their assets, that are putting their assets in, into that ecosystem, are also getting a fair shake of their value. So I think in, in summation, to me, people who are going to create the most amount of value in the logistics or supply chain ecosystem at large, container freight in particular, and, and drage, we'll need to figure out a better way to build collaboration uh, across different participants and a better alignment of interests uh, across different participants. Um, and I think, for me, technology ultimately is a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. Uh, so we, we need to question every single day, what does this technology do to a carrier? Does that get them a better pay? Does that get them paid on time? What does it do to a shipper? Does that actually give them real visibility in terms of where their cargo is, and does that allow us to not just deliver freight on time, but look, this is an industry where things go wrong all the time. And does it allow us and arm us to be able to go back to the customer with bad news, timely, 
and, and with solutions uh, when, when things are going off track. Larry or Paul, add to? Yeah, I would say that the biggest thing that technology provides is visibility. And that is what I'm pretty sure everybody out here, every BCO needs. And over the past 18 months, if you're not providing visibility to someone's supply chain, whether it's on your own assets, your aggregating capacity, you're putting stuff in yards um, and managing container pools and eliminating demurge and per diem, that visibility platform from a DRE provider is key. And you have to be able to deliver that to your clients because that is by far the only thing that folks are concerned about right now. And that's what we've learned over the last 18 months. Where is my freight? Is it cleared through the terminals? Can I trust the data that I'm getting from you know, a terminal site or the port or my trucking provider? So I'd say in summation for our end, providing visibility to our clients is key and you gotta be able to do that in every market throughout the United States because everybody is shipping into East Coast ports that they're not used to, West Coast ports that they're not used to, and playing ping pong to avoid the next upcoming catastrophe. Yeah, I'll, I'll piggyback on the rest of the panelists here, but I, I wanna go down a little bit different path, and it, it really comes back to the journey of the driver. And so without the driver and giving them the proper tools in order to really perform their job really well, it's really hard. For any of you that have not spent any time in a truck or a drayage or anything else, I'd encourage you to do that. It is a really difficult job. We're asking all of these drivers, by the way, if you look at the marketplace, you're talking about $485,000, I mean, it's 485,000 people in all of North America. That's a really small pool. You're asking these folks to do things and getting mad at them for all the different things that everybody else has done, all the different variables that pile up. So when you look at that lens, it's, it's giving the journey, the best possible journey to that driver through technology. Visibility is just a dot in the map. It's really, really small. That's quite honestly, that's table stakes. Yes, it's important to have visibility and transparency. However, you need to understand the other components with that utilizing technology such as you, you have to look at what capacity is. You have to look at what utilization is. And when you understand those components and utilize technology to offer that visibility, now you're cooking with gas. Now you're making that journey better for that driver, which makes it better for all of you in this room. So I want to come back to the, the driver part of this. Did you want to say something? I, I wanted to put a little bow on this, if you don't put mind. Put a bow on it. Okay. So if you look at what's the importance of technology in our industry, right? And everybody, visibility, right? It's a big term, everybody's talking about it. But at the end of the day, visibility is most important to the people moving the freight because when you move the freight, the customer doesn't really care where it is. And I think that's an important part because if you're doing your job, we give visibility away for free. We're integrated with over 70 terminals throughout North America and every rail ramp and blah, 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 right? And we have all the, we have the, the best people in the industry that make sure our platform has real-time visibility for our customers. We have a customer, for instance, we moved over two-thirds of their freight last year. We accounted for less than 10% of their detention and demurrage, and we had a 97% on-time delivery rate in drayage. It's unheard of. Do you know how many times our customer actually logs into our portal to look at their visibility? Zero times because their stuff moves. And that's the important part. Leveraging technology and data to get things right on the front end so it's not needed on the back end is really what's important. So, <clears throat> it's a nice bow. Um, so, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to the driver part in a second. But one of the things I want to push on, and I'm personally not involved in the day-to-day -day like you guys are. But as, as a slight outsider, the term visibility has become a buzzword. Yes. And, you know, visibility doesn't put food on the plate. Now, I agree with you. Every BCO and LPL, they want to know where it is. But at the end of the day, if the cargo's sitting in the wrong place, unless you can action it, you know, it doesn't do, it, it doesn't do as much good, right? You've got to be able to get it out of where it is and get it to the place. So, is there a second phase to visibility where you see more kind of in-depth action ability on the behind it within certain ecosystems? So let's talk about just Ray. Does that come as a second phase than just visibility? And, and you know what? I'm going to do this. Yeah. You go and then I'll go to Larry. Cool. I, I, yeah, okay, fine. So we use visibility not just 
for our client, even though that's something they want. That's how we plan our operations. So over the past 18 months, you have clients that are saying, hey, we have freight showing up in Savannah. You get line of sight on that for four or six weeks. You're able to plan your operations. There were times when people were calling, and I'm going to pick on the East Coast because the West Coast has been uh, beat up enough, um, that people were pulling early in Charleston, that call in Charleston before Savannah. And we started seeing that demand increase. So what we did was we took our drivers, they were Doss Mile down Jacksonville, made sure they were registered with the terminals up there, and repositioned that equipment and those drivers, put them in hotels, whatever, took care of them, of course, and made sure that they were there, ready to execute that freight in Charleston, bringing very, very badly needed chassis and other equipment up there to execute the freight. So I'm not going to sit up here and say that we're just giving this visibility because it's a buzzword, but it helps us efficiently operate and pull freight the way that we need to to service our client. You do the same thing on the West Coast. Maybe in L.A., you start seeing there's a lull, and we need that equipment up in Oakland, or we need it off the ramp further inland, or you're sitting on too many chassis right now, we are, in L.A. Long Beach, and you could use them in Dallas because the inland ramps don't have enough uh, ocean chassis. So that's what we take into consideration when we're planning using the visibility, and it helps us pivot and help our clients as well. Larry, your thoughts on it. Visibility, where does it go from here? Um, great, great point, by the way. Um, so when you, when you look at visibility, as I said before, you've got the other two components to that, which is capacity and utilization. But really, capa you know, visibility has to translate into optimization. And when you start to look at optimization, that is really another key to understanding, unlocking all the different data nodes that go forward with that. So the second tier of that, Stanton, to the visibility, is unlocking all of that data, right? I mean, it has to be clean data, garbage in, garbage out. We all know that. So when you start to look at those things and in, in culminating all those data nodes, that's the part that's really important. And that's the really hard part because we have such old systems. There's multiple different systems. It's so fragmented in this space. It's so, so many different areas, whether you're domestic or whether you're international, whether you have a chassis pool, you don't. All those different data, no data nodes make a huge difference in what happens on the visibility side. And that's the part that we all can do a better job in understanding how do we synthesize all of these ecosystems. Have any other further thoughts? Like how do you unlock the visibility? How do you unlock the data visibility? Your thoughts? Yeah, I'd probably take a step back and look at visibility. Obviously, we talk about visibility with regards to knowing where container freight, where a particular trailer is for a shipper to know on a particular day. But I think visibility goes way beyond that. It goes down to really understanding where waste is in the ecosystem, where bottlenecks are in the ecosystem, because and, and it's probably very obvious to everybody in this room, but when you go out there, maybe it's not very obvious uh, to a lot of people. Everybody for the last two years was talking about such a huge structural shortage of truck drivers in this country. I have not seen an industry where if there is such an acute shortage of an important resource, that resource is getting wasted. 40% of the time that hardworking truck drivers are spending is waiting in lines, doing unnecessary admin work, doing stuff that isn't moving freight and isn't earning them any money. And that is where I think the visibility aspect comes in, is really putting a spotlight, as they say, sunlight is the best dis disinfectant, putting a spotlight to say, why is it that a truck driver has to wait X number of hours, either waiting in lines or doing admin work, which isn't bringing value? Why is it that when we say there's such an acute shortage of chassis, to, to the point that has already been raised, those chassis are sitting in the wrong place. So the visibility actually goes end to end to really identify where bottlenecks are. And I think the common enemy for everybody is that waste from, from a lean angle. And really driving operational execution, op operational excellence, which is the job of every single one of us as operators in, in this ecosystem, to really squeeze that waste out and generate that into value, which ultimately goes into the pockets of the customer, shippers, the end consumers, and most importantly, the carriers. I'm curious on the waste thing. It's a great point, Abs. Does anybody know the average turn in the dray space? Average turn? It's, it's right now, it's about 0.75 a day in, in the LA Long Beach area. You're, you're, if you've got really good asset utilization, you can get 
four to eight if you're doing something like peel off, which is really hard to do now because we don't have the volume in a place like LA Long Beach. Peel off is next container, next truck. You put a whole bunch of things in a pile, you move it all quickly. So to give you guys an idea, we've done a thousand containers in two days using that model, which is really great for asset utilization. It's great for sustainability. Uh, but when you have to go and make an appointment and do all that stuff, you could, you're going to get probably less than one turn a day. I mean, relative to the industry, that's, you know, to Ab's point, a lot of waste, a lot of opportunity within the Dre space. So I want to cut, there's two, a couple points we've hit on that I want to come back to. The first one is, Larry, you kind of went down this road a little bit of the driver. I think you talked about the driver. The driver? Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I'm speaking loud enough. The driver. There we go. Thank you. I'll put my mouth closer to the mic. Um, so is technology really able to be sticky within the Dre space? Because you've got a, an, ex, an extraordinary long tail of owner operators. And these individuals, you know, aren't using technology necessarily, right? So, so is that a problem? Is that a, is that a barrier for some of these things we're talking about? Dri driver adoption is a huge problem, right? Especially because if you look at um, out of the 8,300 trucking companies that are registered, uh, according to IANA, in North America. If you look at the average trucking company, it's six drivers or less. And so when you start to peel that back, and they're owner operators as well, or they're part of a smaller company. So yeah, that, that is a huge problem, is how do you get them to use the technology? And that's probably one of the biggest things that we run into, is that, okay, what, what is the day in the life of a driver? What, what is that process? What does that look like? Do you swipe right? Do you swipe up? Do you hit the bigger button because either they're wearing gloves or whatever else, do you build your apps differently? What do they need? And so that's one of the things that we constantly try to strive for is let's reverse this. And again, for us, it's all about the journey of the driver because as the journey of the driver, the other stakeholders then dispatch operations, management, and then the end customer, everybody is a winner at that point. And it all starts there. So for the driver adoption, we spend an enormous amount of time on UX, UI, looking at what it is, use cases, different areas of the country. We, we've released an agnostic driver app now that can go to any TMS there is. Doesn't matter what, whether it's Excel spreadsheet or whether you have your own proprietary system. So we're really proud of that and taking that on. So as a driver that may work for West in one day, may work it next the next day. Sorry for the pun, but so, uh, but you know, you that is really. They, they wouldn't leave Cargo Matic, but that's okay, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's really important to to get that driver adoption with using the best technology with what makes sense for them. So, so I think the other thing, if you look, a lot of folks within the industry, specifically drivers, like if you speak with trucking companies, and as Larry said, a average trucking company six trucks or less. So these are a lot of very small businesses they don't have the back office presence and the administrative burden to be able to operate in this industry is huge. That's why companies like ours exist because we create technology, we do all the heavy lifting for them and we give them an easy way to continue to build their business. There's nothing more satisfying than working with a trucking company that said, started working with Cargomatic two years ago and now I'm up to 50 trucks and I wouldn't have been able to do it without you bringing me. I, I like to say we give small businesses big opportunities. We're connecting them with blue chip level shippers. We're giving them the technology to be able to operate efficiently but we're also giving that shipper the confidence to work with us, and we're, we're unlocking untapped capacity that they don't want to manage. The shippers want this technology. They do want the visibility. They want to know where their stuff is, the track and trace. However, the people that they need, especially when you look at the last year and a half before we saw a little softening in the market, they needed capacity that they'd never used before and didn't know how to manage. And that's where you need to be able to look outside of maybe what you traditionally did five years ago or 10 years ago. As I like to say, this isn't your granddaddy's supply chain anymore. And we need to be okay with looking at different ways to solve problems. And one of them is by connecting these small businesses and giving them the tools that they need to easily and functionally be able to do the work. And there's different approaches to it. It could be the utilization of our mobile app. It could be integrating with our partners where they have TMS or TMS lights already put in place. In some cases, and we're really doing uh, the best job we can to try to educate drivers on how to properly use our technology, but in some cases when you're getting them going, you have to do some of the work for them. And that is a big part of it. You gotta make their job easy because these men and women are literally moving our economy. They're giving you the quality of life. 
and there's not a business in the world that does not rely on its supply chain. So let's treat these truck drivers and the supply chain partners with the dignity and respect that they deserve and build tools that make their jobs easier. So, all right, so Paul, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, by all means, yes. There's a trucker out there. <laughs> Getting back to, you know, does it have legs? Is this going to be around? Like right now, things are kind of light. Is there going to be technology in this space anymore? And I think that we've had a paradigm shift that if you are not a Dre provider in a very prior to 18 months ago, fragmented, regional, small carrier capacity world, if you're not aggregating capacity, picking up a container overseas, watching that go through the terminal, feeding that back, planning capacity, and that one part where the driver pulls it out, making it very easy for him to be part of that technology ecosystem, putting up geofences around your drop and pick locations, and not having them say, hey, I'm in, I'm out, and, and, and making the burden so problematic for them that they don't adapt UI UX. On our end, what we try to do is put as many geofences and as many APIs in place and bounce those off against each other. And I'll, I'll throw it out there using this gentleman's yards and some of his technology, container goes in, container goes out. That's what's triggering these events. That's what we know our drivers are doing and they're not having to, to deal with that. And when they get that termination back to the port, not only do our clients know that that clock stopped, but now that is what triggers our drivers to get paid and move on to the next thing. You can manage their tour, uh, turns. You can get them more efficient. Right now, with all the empties sitting out because inventories are so high and loaded containers out, you need to manage these pools. And a lot of times you're taking these drivers and bifurcating what they're doing. Some guys are just doing port all the time. Some guys are going to be cleaning up empty pools going to where they can terminate these containers throughout uh, a, a probably 100 square mile area and pay those drivers for that work. Whereas your line haul used to be pick up, deliver, and that's all you got. Well, now if I have to go to this yard and pull an empty from here, terminate it here, and go to this full and go to another pool, the drivers are A, showing the work that they're doing and getting paid for it, and we're getting efficiency for our clients to manage that. And I don't think it's going anywhere. If, if we have to continue, continuously adapt to ebbs and flows in, in demand, you're going to need to start working with folks like Cargomatic and ITS and Next to aggregate and hurt all these cats, and more importantly, have folks that have a not just nationwide or regional connection, but a North American connection. Yeah. And, and if, good hey, job. Hey, hey Weston, I'm gonna- We got a fan gonna, club here, it's great. I do. Hey, yeah. Weston, we're, Weston, we're right yeah. Weston, I'm gonna pause you for one second. Well said, by the way. Abs, did you wanna join in here before, um, before Weston puts a bow on it for us? <laughs> it's the only part of the present I can do. So look, I, I, I think that technology ultimately, and I said that before, is, is a means to an end, and it, it's a lot easier to get somebody to move from A to B when you actually meet them at A, understand, sit in their shoes, understand what their needs, limitations are, rather than sitting at B and saying, I've built a beautiful piece of software, I put a bow on it, I put it on your doorstep, look at all the great things you can do with it. What do I mean by that? I think it's really sitting in the shoes, whether it's a truck driver, whether it's a yard owner, whether it's a chassis pool provider, to really understand why is it that they're not adopting the technology uh, all these years? Dre, and I think marketplaces have been existing in, in B2C and B2B for quite a while. Uh, Tech-enabled marketplaces have been around for quite a while. The, the analogy I use is if you look at Uber or Lyft in, in the ride-hailing world as matching a two-sided marketplace, Dre especially is probably matching six, seven, maybe eight different stakeholders with different pieces being contributed. So I think it's a given that applied correctly, there is a huge role for technology to simplify processes, simplify the problem statement. But I think what we also need to do as technologists and, and product uh, engineers, and we think of ourselves, and I think, quite frankly, anybody to be successful in this world will need to embrace the duality between being product and tech-oriented but then being deeply operational. It is a blue collar industry. We really need to understand the nitty gritty and, and the devil in many cases is really in the detail, is to 
go down to the specifics of, yeah, it doesn't look like the most elegant way to develop an app, but if that's what makes Joe the driver adapt it better, easier today, then that is the right way to go. If the right answer is to do an EDI integration, it's not avant-garde, it's not API, then that is the right thing. Quite frankly, if the right thing to do is to take a CSV file, download, and, and ingest it in whatever format it exists, that is the right thing to do. So I think the role for technology is to meet people where they are, adapt to the world as it is, and then over time sell the real value to people rather than saying, that's the shiny new object and you, you all must adopt it. Yeah, I, so one of the things I wanted to talk about, because you brought up where is, where is technology today and where are we going with it, right? And I'm gonna use, we've heard the word chassis shortage a few times, so I'll give you a real world example. What we use technology for today by and large is identifying problems, which we all know about. We're just confirming that the problems exist, right? So a great example of that is pool of pools, largest chassis pool in the country in LA Long Beach, 50 some odd, 58,000 chassis, give or take. Um, it was designed for when you pick up a container, deliver it and go back, right? And the average days on the street was designed for two and a half days. It got over 10 days at one point in time. Why? Because shippers were using it for storage because they ran out of space in warehouses. Truckers could not return empty containers because ships were leave, coming in full but leaving half full. So you ran out of space at docks. So chassis became a, uh, a storage mechanism, warehouse on wheels, right? Made Larry very happy because he, he has a whole you know, program around this. But the next step is using the data to solve the problem, not to identify the problem. So you even look at what we've done. I know it's not novel. A lot of people have done it, but we figured out a way to better service our customers by getting things out of the port and freeing up the chassis with grounded storage operations. We all have different takes on this. Not going to give you our secret sauce, but it's worked really well. And then we're able through with our brokerage model, get drivers in and out in less than 30 minutes. So they have a better driver experience. They get to make more money moving the terminal, right? These are all important things because we identified a problem. There's not enough chassis in the market based on the way the market's working today. We identified a solution. We put it in place. We measured it. We made happy customers. That's where it has to go. Yep, totally agree. Um, yeah, the, the, it's funny because we, at, at Blumberg, we made an investment into a, a gate technology, a camera technology at entry points, right? And one of our thesis was, if you think about the airlines, right, they can't only have all the airplanes sitting in Alabama at the end of the night, otherwise people aren't getting anywhere. Same thing with chassis, right? You gotta coordinate chassis better in the United States. And I'm, I say you have to. I, I don't mean to you know, be dogmatic or sound kind of out of, out of, out of touch, um, but it does make a huge difference. And finding the technology that can both identify and then do something about it is huge. Um, so I, I wanna kind of now shift back one of the other points, I think, Abs, that you kind of touched on, which is costs of DRE. So I think we all agree that prior to the pandemic, you know, BCOs didn't have a, quite an appreciation for the detail, the cost of DRE. I think they knew, you know, generally, but it was hard to kind of nail it down. And so it, it appears that post that, post COVID, there's been a lot more focus on costs within DRE. What is that pressure gonna mean to the industry? What's it gonna mean for you guys? How are you gonna react? What are you gonna do? Um, why don't we start this question with Larry and we'll go to abs right after that. Yeah, um, if you look at cost historically, at least from a Drayman's perspective, they're still operating on fuel surcharges that are five, six, seven, ten 10 years old. And so that, that's problem number one, right? I mean, they're, they're working with outdated tools and they're having to pass that on. There are other things that are hidden there that whether it's a sweep out of a container that it's five bucks or it's an accessorial that they've got to bake in there. And then the shipper says, no, I'm not buying that. Sorry, you have to eat that, right? So the cost mechanism is still relatively the same. And when you look at the, the cost of a DRE in comparison to at the overall cost of the container, it's really small. But the poor Drayman has got to suffer with all the other variables and say, no, you need to eat this. And so how do we get around that? We have to be able to work faster, right? So as Weston said, and, and as everybody else had said, it's the turns that you have to get a day, right? Um, I, I won't pick on West Coast. Weston, you can back me up here. I mean, if we've got, you know, 15 to 18,000 drivers that go through, you know, California every day, and they've got to pick up X amount of containers that far exceed that, do the math. You can't pick them up. So you have to be able to work smarter. And if they're only going out the door for 375 bucks, 450 bucks, how do they survive? 
So the cost has got to come up. So when, they, when the Draymond comes in and says, I need to go up 3 or 4 or 5%, they really do. Their insurance has gone up. The cost of living has gone up. They're not getting Kohler increases. Those are the things that are really important that we as a group have to understand that that 3 or 5%, they probably even asked for it even the year before because they were told they were going to get thrown out. Abs? Yeah, look, I, th I think simple math. Uh, um, container freights have gone from, you, you can pick your number, whether you were in the spot market or in the contracted market, 15, 20,000 plus. At that point, drage was probably 3% of, of that number. Today, container freights rates are probably back to reality uh, in, in the pre-pandemic world. Call it 1,500, 2,000 on the Trans-Pacific. Dre, as a percentage of that, is starting to look more expensive. Um, and clearly, everybody is tightening their belts. So I think the focus on cost, not to say ever went away, but is getting exacerbated, and I think will remain a, a spotlight. H how do you address that? I think, I, I go back to, there is a lot of waste which all of us as operators in this industry need to get far better. And I think it, the only way to really structurally take that away is to work collaboratively across different parts of the value chain. Because if each chassis provider is optimizing their piece, Weston brought up the point around the pool of pools, we can all, all have hours and hours of conversation why that did not work, because everybody was optimizing for their piece, and everybody is watching for their backyard and, and putting the troubles into other people's backyards. So I think it's really for the industry and key participants to come together and, and say there is this clear inefficiency in how we operate today. We need to attack the waste. We need to extract the value out of what's causing in ex excessive cost for everybody. And I think the people who do that exceptionally well in terms of operationally driving that in and out every day are the ones who are going to keep their costs lower. And this is not an industry where you will attract premium pricing. Uh, I, I think that's a given. Um, so it, it has to go down to really driving cost efficiencies out through yeah. collaboration, through better use of data and technology, and most, most importantly, by being maniacal about going after the waste that exists. Yeah. Paul, and I'm going to try to keep it to about a minute because we start running. Gotcha. So, yeah. Okay, fine. Uh, the quickest answer to this would be training clients and having conversations about how we are rating drayage moves. Uh, you know, earlier it was stated, you know, accessorials. And that is, at the end of the day, over half, and especially what people saw 18 months ago, what they were being billed for. Days of storage, chassis days, additional line hauls, all these added costs. And when you go into an RFP and you're talking to what a driver gets paid, that line haul, maybe it's 600 bucks from LA out to Ontario, but they're beating down that cost because they know of the accessorials and play on the back end. You have to be, as a Dre provider, super efficient, provide a high level of service to your clients and sell to them, I'm going to eliminate or reduce drastically these accessorials. There's so many times when I started in this field, going to my clients and saying, this is our rate. And they would say, this is higher. It's 50% higher than your competition. But you go to them and say, let me see your invoice. Always look at your invoice. And we were well below what they were paying for that Dre move. So it's Having a paradigm shift with the BCO to know that that cost is actually going to be better if you pay a little bit more in that line haul. I'm going to do a 10 second rapid fire last thing. One just quick question okay. thing. So, we, yeah. Uh, so, I think far too many people in this industry make money off the inefficiencies. And we, quite frankly, try to do two things be the best provider and the cheapest provider for our customers, create value. And by eliminating all those costs, if I can eliminate 90% of somebody's accessorial, a driver can make a little bit more money because we're actually moving freight. And that's what we should all be doing, is trying to make money for moving freight, not trying to make money when freight doesn't move. Abs, you got the last word because I think you started last. Any last thoughts? I'd say, look, we, we, we wasted too much time. We need to collaborate, align interests, and go after the waste. Yeah. That's awesome. All right, we're done. 
Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.